Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's episode we're going to be talking about isotopic abundance and mass spectrometry. Thinking within the context of our unit to do with the models of the atom and thinking about um, how our understanding of the atom has progressed through history. We've, in the past we've looked at very early models and then we've, we've shown the, the, the kind of increase in ideas over time. And now we're in thinking about a more current model of the atom, thinking about a tool that um, scientists have available them to, to them to identify the abundance of different isotopes, and that is mass spectrometry. So we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of a mass spectrometer and kind of how the different components in that instrument are put together. We'll talk about then how that they function together to, to make it work. We'll look at the, the physical principle or the, 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 fin, the principle that involves um, separating the components, which is separation by deflection, and then looking at interpreting the mass spectrum that results. So this is a, a simplified kind of schematic of a mass spectrometer. We're going to go through the process kind of step by step in a moment, but so a couple of key features here to, to show you. We've got a, a section where there's ionization, acceleration, we've got deflection um, with the presence of an electromagnet, and then detection at the end, which are the four main stages. So our sample goes in here in the form of a vapor, and then the, de the, um, the signal is detected at the other end here. So it's often, we'll think about in, in a future kind of um, unit, thinking about how it might be typically connected to a separation technique um, to analyze components of a mixture. But today we're looking about it of analyzing the isotopes of a particular element. Okay, so where it can be used directly. All right, so let's look through the, the stages of how this works. The first one is that we get a, a heated filament lamp, like the sort of thing that you'd have in an incandescent globe, which gives off electrons. So that beam of electrons, is fired at right angles to with the atoms of the sample that is injected. So it's kind of, if we've got the sample kind of coming in from the side, then the electrons are fired at right angles in order to collide with the atoms of the sample. What it does is as that collision happens, it knocks electrons off the existing atom, leaving a positive ion or a cation behind. So we have the atoms that entered have now become positive ions. And the idea is that these positive ions are now subjected to an electric field. They're accelerated. So we have a positively charged kind of electrode behind them that repels or pushes them in towards the direction of a magnetic field, which is where the separation is going to happen. So it, it has the effect of pushing them horizontally into the, the, the rest of the instrument. As the, uh, these ions enter this magnetic field, that because of the strength of that magnetic field and its fine tuning, that these ions are then deflected. So their path is deviated or bent or, you know, according to a curve, and that this is based on the ratio of, of their mass to their, their electric charge, or m slash z is kind of the technical term for it. So by varying the magnetic field and the, the voltage of acceleration, that then we can actually choose ions that are very, have a very specific mass to their nucleus. Um, and so the idea being that where if we tweak these, then, then we can control the ions that we detect at the other end. The ions that pass through the magnetic field, uh, the, you know, it hits the end and we get a signal, which is then amplified, which it works largely the same as, as a, a, an amplifier takes a signal from an electric guitar and boosts it up so you can hear it, um, so that it has the, the effect of making it more visible or easily uh, understood. And then this detector that's got this amplified signal creates a mass spectrum. So there's the kind of that's the output, um, which so it shows two kind of things in this situation. The first one is that the relative atomic mass of each isotope in atomic mass units, which is kind of the, the um, theoretical unit of measurement of, of something at the atomic scale. You know, so whether it's 46 or it's 23 or it's 12 or, or whatever. So, you know, carbon 12 has an atomic mass of 12 mass units, or atomic mass, AMU. Okay, so that... Um, it shows, all right, so this is the mass of the isotope and also its relative abundance as a percentage of the whole sample. So once all the, the, the atoms of the sample have passed through, then it looks at, okay, well, how, how abundant is each version of that element in that mixture? Okay, so let's just have a, a quick talk through this idea of separation by deflection. Okay, so this is, again, a pretty simplified schematic of, of what happens, but showing in particular this curved section, which is our magnetic field. So what happen, happens, we've got our, our sample that is accelerated and then travels into the magnetic field. Now, posit um, positively charged particles, when they're subjected to a magnetic field, will be deflected into a circular path. Now, obviously, we don't have a full circle here, but we do have a portion of a circle in this path here. And the idea is that the strength of that magnetic field controls how strongly those particles are deflected. 
Okay, so we've got some particles which are, um, are too heavy. What happens is that they get there, that's this our purple path. That this there's, there's not enough deflection for them to travel through to the end here. And so what happens, so you can see that they're, they're too, too little deflection or they don't deviate very much from their straight line path where they started, and so they collide with the side here. But likewise, if we have something that is too light or too small in mass, it deflects too strongly. So it deviates more strongly than it should, and so it collides with the side over here and doesn't pass through the detector. Whereas um, the ions with the, the right mass to charge ratio or the one that we're after, are the ones that travel all the way through the magnetic field and then collide with the detector at the other end. And then what happens once we picked up that signal, then we can actually tweak the voltage and then we can actually um, select for a different mass to come through. Okay, and so that, that way we can select for each one at a time. Um, and so um, we can then pick up the signal that corresponds to each, the, the correct um, mass. So the only that specific mass will pass through. And so what we get is a mass spectrum that looks a bit like this at the other end. Okay, so what we have is that the, the relative atomic mass listed in atomic mass units is, is shown here at the top of the diagram. So corresponding to, oh, the, the, these are kind of offset a little bit. This should be 23, 24, 25, and so on. Okay, um, so that, yeah, just that's just from the diagram. My apologies there. Um, and so then the idea of actually, you know, saying this is what corresponds to the signal from each of those masses. So that should be 24, 25, and 26. Um, and so then it shows you the relative abundances underneath. So saying that of the samples that were measured, 78.7% of it was had an atomic mass of 24 AMU. Okay, only 10.3 had 25 and 11.2 had 26. But so then that gives you that we can use that information to help us calculate the average atomic mass or average molar mass of that particular element. So this one happens to be corresponding to magnesium. Um, and so then we can say, all right, well, if you know, what, what's the, the mass of your average magnesium atom going to be, okay? Or, you know, if you've got a thousand magnesium atoms or a million magnesium atoms, what's their average mass going to be? So you can, we can say, all right, well, it's 78.7% of this and so on, and, and combine those together to get an average mass of around about 24.3. Okay, so what we've seen is that we can use mass spectrometry to, for us to be able to um, to, to separate and detect the different isotopes of a given element to measure their um, relative uh, abundance that then we can use to calculate the average molar mass of each element. All right, thanks very much for watching. Uh, now, prom promise to, to finish with a joke this time after being a bit too serious for too long. Um, so, what did the scientist say when he found two isotopes of helium? He he. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.